Marcus Ian Altsy. I'm the founder and principal of Message Agency. Uh, we're going to talk today um, about a case study uh, for a website redesign we did for the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. I'm going to just take you on a kind of a whirlwind tour of the project a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about you know the challenge that our client faced, uh, the research we did and the strategy we developed, and then some of the key features of the site. Also, uh, just talk a little bit about why Drupal in particular was the right content management system uh, for this case. Uh, the, you know, the content strategy was pretty sophisticated and uh, we were able to really leverage Drupal 8's tools uh, to give them a, what we think is a great site. So with that, I uh, just wanna, oh, oh, there we go. So a little bit about message agency. Um, we are a full service digital agency in Philadelphia. Uh, we are primarily a Drupal shop. We, you know, did adopt WordPress begrudgingly <laughs> a few years back, uh, but we primarily build in Drupal. Uh, we actually only work uh, with nonprofits, universities, foundations, and government, and we're a B corporation. I don't know. Does anybody know what a B corp is? No. All right. I won't go into it. Look it up. It's very interesting. It's a pretty rigorous certification uh, that says our business has a social or environmental impact as a fundamental part of what we do, uh, and it really does um, impact how we relate to clients and, and the types of projects we, we take. Um, so, uh, a little bit about the challenge for the John Carter Brown Library. Um, so, the library is a really unique uh, institution. It's actually on Brown's campus, but it's not a part of the university. It was uh, a library that uh, was founded by the, uh, uh, the institution's founder, uh, but it's very much tied to a collection that is from maybe pre-Columbian times to 1825, uh, and it's only about the study of the Americas. So it's books, manuscripts, maps, um, and all other types of artifacts just about that geography and that period of time. So really, really, really specific, but it is a, a preeminent research collection and it's known uh, by scholars who, who study that, uh, that period and that, and that geography. Um, it's, uh, it sounds kind of arcane <laughs> and irrelevant uh, because it's, it's just a very specific uh, subject matter. But actually, there was a lot in the collection that speaks to, uh, to the history of slavery, uh, to colonialism, and you know, has a lot of primary texts and a lot of primary you know, sources that shed light on a lot of the um, you know, issues that, uh, that we're dealing with you know, um, uh, today cult in cultural and social uh, aspects. And you know, the library uh, was struggling with basically being a, you know, um, a, uh, an institution that was uh, a, appeared to be um, obscure and inaccessible. Uh, one example uh, of a piece in their collection was uh, a first edition of the poems of Phyllis Wheatley, uh, and that's this is the frontispiece from that book. Uh, and she was a slave uh, who wrote and published poetry in the 1700s. So, so just some really interesting and unexpected assets. Uh, there were kind of two two sort of views of the library. This is what you see when you look at it. Very imposing edifice, um, you know, uh, very sort of not, not transparent at all, uh, not feeling very welcome or, or accessible, and pretty closed off. No signs, no placards. Uh, one of our staff members actually who worked on this project went to Brown and said he passed by that building every day on his way to classes and never had an idea, you know, what it was and what was contained there. Um, another, is the old website. Um, so we all look at this and can, you know, it's a pretty uninspired <laughs> experience there. Um, a lot of their users were remote because it was a lot of scholars who were sort of spread around. Uh, and, you know, the, the site itself was, um, you know, very challenging to navigate. And, and that's a real challenge when most of your users, uh, you know, are not actually physically coming to the library. It also provides limitations in, in how you can engage uh, your end users. There was no way to showcase any of the collections. Um, you know, you would never realize from looking at that, you know, what was actually there and how amazing uh, some of the things in the collections are. Uh, it wasn't responsive, very inflexible, uh, and it also kind of made the relationship, <clears throat> the relationship between the library and Brown University, uh, it, it muddled it a little bit because it sat on a Brown, uh, on, on a domain, on Brown's domain. 
but it really wasn't a part of the university. So really, really confused. Uh, so what led to this transformation? What was sort of the impetus for this project and, and what we were able to do for them? Uh, there was a new moment in uh, the university's, or sorry, in the library's uh, evolution. And one was fresh leadership. Uh, they recruited Neil Sefier as the library director. And he, he, has, uh, a, he has a really interesting vision about how he wanted to make the library's resources more relevant. Uh, he was a researcher in Americana. Uh, but he's also, he had experience sort of running other organizations as an executive. Uh, so not just being an, an academic, he had a different perspective in what he brought to the library. Uh, and also bringing on new uh, talent internally around uh, their digital assets. So in addition to that staff uh, and, and sort of the new moment at the institution, they then wanted to rebrand. Uh, and they needed to change in their image for sure. Uh, but one of the things that the rebrand led to uh, was an opportunity to think in different ways about who they engaged and how they engaged them. Uh, you know, the assumption was their current audiences were fellows who, you know, came to study uh, at the institution and were uh, sort of, uh, you know, there present uh, at the library, uh, or scholars from, uh, you know, South America, Central America, some in Europe, doing, you know, needing to access this information for their research. But they didn't, uh, they didn't want to stop there. They wanted to think how could their collection become interesting and relevant to a much broader, uh, a much broader group. So we kind of defined a few key strategies here. Uh, one of them, this, this is what, uh, these are strategies that informed our design. Uh, one was trying to translate what was very valuable about the experience that fellows had and people who came to the library uh, and sort of the aha moment that they would have uh, in that library that we got to see many of the materials that one of our first experiences was uh, actually going into into a room where all of these books and maps were laid out on the table and it was some of the most exquisite and amazing things we had ever seen um, you know books that had uh, that were cosmology and had uh, a series of circles that were fixed to a page that you could move and this was made in the 1500s and just some just really amazing pieces. Um, so trying to think about how could this site give that sense of wonder and excitement to people who uh, were visiting it. Um, also, you know, expanding access to their collection. Uh, they were digitizing a lot, uh, but you know, we wanted to make sure in addition to just easy access for researchers to their, uh, their catalog and other uh, finding aids and, and other resource material uh, that they could actually see as much of the, um, the actual assets as possible. Uh, also disseminating uh, information that was sort of more public facing and interpretive content. So giving them the ability to, you know, create uh, really nice exhibitions uh, that weren't, <laughs> weren't intended for scholars, uh, that were intended for people who were, you know, interested uh, in this material for a variety of reasons. Um, also, you know, focusing on some of the things that were happening at the library, the, the talks, the lectures, uh, the content and the way that the library was shifting how it talked about these materials and how it was actually applying some of this information to current events. Uh, and, and making sure that that was front and center and they had the ability to focus on that. Um, promoting you know, some of the really interesting collaborations uh, that they had been working on and, and, and forming over the years with international um, with scholars and with uh, other international institutions. Um, and also increasing support for underrepresented scholars. So this was uh, you know, an effort that the library uh, was doing in real life and they wanted to make sure that that was also evident uh, in, on this site. So our design approach, um, we have a really simple tool for uh, when we don't have a budget to do extensive user research, uh, we always prefer <laughs> to, to have that. Not every project allows us to do that. And um, so we have something called a top tasks analysis. Really, really simple uh, way of obtaining from, you know, usually current users, so it's tougher for aspirational users, but it really does give you a sense for people visiting the site, what are the top things that they're looking for. And so the, the survey is just basically a task list, and it's long on purpose, but it's a one question survey, and it asks users just to select the top uh, five things that they want to do on the site. 
And you know, there's really interesting, this, this, we do this often, and we can really, we usually can divide things up into some pretty neat quartiles uh, to see what users are, uh, are coming to the site for. Uh, and this one, we had 139 respondents to the survey, so it was for us a pretty good uh, response rate. Uh, and a majority of the respondents were fellows. There were some community members, staff, and, and some researchers. Uh, and so for this one, it was really telling us that, you know, to reach non-academic audiences, they needed to reprioritize their content strategy. Um, you know, look at, looking at how their current collection, uh, you know, relates to trends and events and, and current events. Uh, and, you know, their online exhibitions were ranking much higher for non-academic than academic audiences based on this. So we knew that was a, a direction to, to move in. Uh, also, we did some pretty extensive user personas. Everybody know, hopefully everyone, let's be clear, know what user personas are. Um, they're a very important step in this process because uh, the library was really focusing this entire effort on a completely new set of audiences. Uh, and they were audiences they sort of knew about. They didn't necessarily have, uh, a, you know, in-depth knowledge. Uh, we we had hoped that we would be able to again do more research. So some of the, the personas were based on uh, our clients' perceptions of these audiences, and, and we're hoping they'll take these and test them uh, later uh, and refine them if needed. Uh, but we ended up with nine different personas, um, and you know, some of the things that. Uh, that were important about this is half of the personas were related to non-traditional audiences, um, you know, and many, many of them, as I said, were aspirational. Uh, we wanted to ensure that the browse and explore experience was well organized, uh, that it was curated, or the you know the admin could really curate that experience, and that it was also accessible. That was very important. Um, we had to think a little bit about uh, language translation and reading level. A lot of the books were. Uh, or are, uh, the titles are Latin or Spanish, and they're very long, uh, and we had to actually think about that when we were doing the designs, um, and think through, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the pieces actually had alternate, sort of a vernacular title that scholars would refer to that, um, to that book by. And we were able to figure out in the content strategy how to include that, but also keep the, the title uh, fairly prominent. Uh, and then we also wanted to emphasize images heavily in the design um, so that, again, the experience was much richer. Um, so one of the things we did uh, based on our analysis of their audiences, especially aspirational audiences, was to prioritize discovery over research. Um, that was a kind of a bold move for this library. So. You know, the idea was that when someone came to the site, you know, the typical approach for a research library uh, is it's more technical, right? So you're, you know, uh, you want to see a, a description of the collections, get right to the catalog, look at digital assets, kind of, you know, how to use the library, things that were uh, a little more perfunctory. But we decided to kind of separate those experiences out uh, and have the, the things that a researcher might be looking for easy to find, obviously, right? So it's, it's, it was, you know, one step uh, to get there. But we, in the design itself, and the experience of the site, especially on the homepage, uh, it was very clear that it was about a browse experience, uh, and more about discovering what was there, and understanding what the library was about. Uh, we also wanted to demonstrate how the collection's relevant to a much broader range of stakeholders. So we, we wanted to do a little bit of storytelling um, and we wanted to do that by creating a more organic path uh, through the content and not make it, you know, not create a burden for their staff to just create more content. We wanted to tell a story uh, through categories and, and in the way that uh, the layout actually exposed metadata and other things. Um, so that was a, that was a uh, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, and then also, you know, we wanted to provide them with a really flexible architecture. So when we, when we build sites, we like to build them so that our clients have a lot of control uh, over layouts. Um, you know, and, and we actually, we use paragraphs pretty heavily for that. Um, and, you know, and design homepages, they can, you know, tend to rearrange the homepage as they want, add new paragraph bands of different types that we make available to them. 
sometimes they go a little crazy and we have to, <laughs> we have to you know, roll things back a little bit and, uh, you know, uh, tell them with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, but for the most part, it, it works out well for them. They don't have to come back to us when they, you know, have a really, you know, an, an important um, event or an important initiative that they have to have front and center and, and they're limited by the layout. Uh, where they're able to adjust it as needed. So a little bit about the technical approach here. Um, so paragraphs and more paragraphs. Um, for this site in particular, it was uh, there are a lot of uh, we, they're heavily used, as I mentioned. Uh, we also give our clients often the ability to use paragraphs on landing pages, uh, so that they're not just overviews of site sections, but they can also be used as standalone pages or sub pages and have their own. Um, you know, their own, so they could be a long form page and tell a story, they could be a landing page from a you know, newsletter, uh, and they're very, very flexible. Um, we, we've, we use some you know, different types of paragraph types, uh, billboards, it's like a simple highlight with a hero image. Uh, for here, there was a collection carousel. Uh, we'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, some story bands where you can have just a sort of band with you know headings and, and text and buttons but also images alternately uh, and then we also um, gave them a views container uh, so that they could pull in views on different landing pages any views that had been defined they could automatically pull them in you know on it maybe there was a press page and they wanted to pull in a news feed they could they could do that or remove it um, if they wanted to so this was just an example of what the billboard looks like. Uh, we don't just, it's not a slider. We, don't, we, we try to uh, persuade clients not to use sliders anymore. Uh, an example of a story band. Uh, this, was, this is part of the collection carousel, discover the collection, uh, and the views container that they were able to control. Um, I can show you what that looks like live. Uh, so here's the site. And here's an example of how they're you know, putting front and center um, you know, how they're using the, the materials they have and, and sort of reinterpreting um, and making them more relevant uh, to things that are, that are happening currently. Uh, this is the, there we go. So this is the carousel. And I'll talk a little bit about how this is architected. There's a, a very specific way that we either had a, a mosaic or uh, individual uh, signature images, the events, and, and the footer. Okay. It's really hard to see, to see that from here. Uh, so this is just an example of the bands. Uh, so the collection highlights were actually uh, where this storytelling started to emerge. Um, we decided to, instead of just having a, you know, uh, just a, a simple list uh, of the, the collection items or grouping them by, you know, uh, just by date or, you know, by who sort of uh, provided the items in a collection, um, we decided to actually use these genres, uh, places, themes, this is taxonomy, uh, that lets them, you know, uh, uh, you know, identify for each collection or for each collection item uh, can belong to one or more of these categories. Um, it is a landing page and it has uh, a grid with taxonomy filters. Uh, the default display is random and after that the user can kind of drill down uh, to specific categories. Uh, and it's constructed as a view that shows all collection items across collection sets. Um, in terms of how this was constructed, um, there were some navigation challenges here that I can show you, which is once you drill down, because some of these collection items can belong to multiple sets, we had a challenge when you drilled down to the node, which was a collection item, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to go back uh, to where you would come from, because one item might be under, um, might be under a, a certain theme, or you know, a certain language. And if you were browsing uh, through one of these themes, then uh, you, know, you wouldn't be, if you just didn't want to click the back button, we wanted to make sure that you could go back to the path that you were following. So um, we used 
uh, a parameter in the URL uh, for that. So uh, we, we take that when the user clicks an item and um, it'll append that specific term uh, and the context in which the user was accessing uh, that node. Uh, and then it provides a back button so they could follow the path back to that term. Uh, so to show you an example, uh, so I'm looking at the genre. So here's, you know, discover. This is the default. And it's just a simple list. And if we go to genres, um, it's collecting highlights so the, uh, the admin can actually identify which nodes they'd like to show up uh, as a, in a feature uh, in a grid. Maybe we go to book. This is where you can see a list of the items. And here is part of the item itself. We have links right to the catalog record. If this is a researcher, all of the taxonomy terms that it's related to, but then you can go back and browse book. It was just a, um, it was a UX challenge that we were able to, uh, we were able to solve. Uh, and here it is as a screenshot. Uh, another thing about the collection item itself uh, is that you know we wanted to give the uh, in addition to the those high level taxonomy. Yes. So going back to the taxonomy, uh, let's say you have a node that is uh, with two different taxonomy terms, right? How do you create the path? Because you know the path only contains one taxonomy. Yes. Um, so, I must not have explained that very well. Sorry about that. So, what we did, let me go back to book. So, uh, let's say we are looking at the genre uh, category and we picked book. When we click here, you will see up here in the URL, we appended the term. It was a very simple um, uh, just a, a very simple solution. And because that term was there, it means that the book, the book icon will show up. That's, it's as simple as that. But it was a big UX challenge, uh, and we were able to, to solve that. Does that answer your question? Was, uh, Go ahead. Uh, was that a, a, a um, like multi-layer, a multi-level taxonomy to have like, um, the different and that genre types, so like the higher level, were they all in one list with children? No, they're, 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 uh, so, so then the, the top level page where you can choose uh, those different options uh, to search or filter by, um, was that hard coded then? There, there were, there was a lot of custom work here. Um, you know, I'm not a developer, so I'm not, <laughs> not going to, uh, to even try to, you know, go any deeper with, with that question. But I do know there was, there was a lot of um, custom code to get some of these uh, pages and layouts to work. Uh, this was just, a, uh, you know, that we needed that for this as well. Uh, all right. Any other questions before I keep going? One of the things we, we wanted to do in, in addition to letting um, the end user kind of, you know, uh, just browse and organically navigate through these taxonomy terms. We wanted to give uh, the admin the ability to also relate items that, that didn't share a taxonomy term, but for some reason, um, you know, had a relationship. So we allowed them to also do a one-to-one -one, um, reference uh, with related content. So that was another uh, opportunity. Uh, and then, of course, through taxonomy, more from the collection at the bottom of the of the item. Okay, um, exhibitions were actually the most challenging feature of the site, and where where custom code was really leveraged was was for the exhibitions. Um, it was uh, kind of an example um, for us, like a lesson learned for us here. We did not have the content ahead of time when we designed this feature. We sort of talked through the client, you know, talked through their needs, but they didn't have the actual structure of the content and, and what they wanted to put uh, into this exhibition. Uh, and so, you know, when they started populating the content, we realized uh, that their vision, or at least what they wanted to put in there, 
was uh, a little different and it was sort of stressing the layout or stretching the layout uh, to its maximum. And you know, I think uh, that was a lesson we learned about really just making sure for something as complex as this that we have examples of the content from the client rather than relying on the conversation uh, you know, to deliver the design. So they, did, they needed a tool for generating exhibits um, as part of the site. They used to uh, spin up individual like microsites for every single exhibit that they, they did, and there were dozens of them, and it was unwieldy. So this was a very important, um, very important tool for them. So I'll just give you a little bit of a highlight of uh, the exhibition. Uh, so they were not only doing online exhibitions, but also archiving exhibitions that were in the library itself, uh, and pulling you know specific things from the. Uh, uh, you know, uh, assets from a much larger in, uh, exhibition in the library itself. So uh, the exhibitions are structured uh, using metadata uh, and then also links to third party sites if needed because they still have those sites out there. Um, and there is a carousel. Uh, the carousel, it's, it's multiple carousels uh, and interpretive text. So the reason we put the box around this uh, is that this is actually in here? Um, I don't know if it's a band. I can't. I don't know if it's a band, and they can add a heading, some interpretive text, and then as many images as they want in that carousel. But you can see all of the. T it's really text heavy. We, no matter what we did, we could we couldn't get them to, you know, be a little more brief uh, about some of these things, uh, and so it really did. It really did stress the design because it, it created very very long pages. Um, instead of you know, um, if if a lot of the text was shorter and and the inter you know the interpretive material was just a, you know a little more modest, um, you know it would have made the page a lot uh, shorter, maybe with more more slides. Uh, so we might have done that a little differently, but it is serving their purposes for now. Um, so again. There was a lot that was custom, so we'll put that out there. Uh, but it did leverage some key core and contributed modules. Um, most of the full page displays uh, use a custom layout, um, and but it does use the uh, layout discovery module, the core layout discovery module. And in the background, we're using Display Street, Display Suite, uh, and Bootstrap layouts. Um, so there were some things we were able to. Uh, leverage from uh, Contrib. And what we learned. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, tackling the content problem first, um, you know, especially with arcane subject matter like this. Uh, you know, the issue with the, with the titles of some of those books, uh, you know, came up a little, little more down the, the line than we would have liked. We would have liked to really tackle that during design. Uh, but we had to make some adjustments uh, during development for those. Um, and, you know, one of the other things we learned is even before the site, uh, you know, has been themed, making sure our client is actually either giving us the content to post or they're posting it themselves. So that when the theme um, is being worked on, you know, we, we can see where things are being stressed and, and what adjustments we might have to make. Um, the other thing that was actually a, a big success for this project is the client, um, they, they had a very long list of, and some very, uh, some very intricate functionality that they were looking for. A lot of it around search. Um, they were, you know, looking for a tighter integration between their catalog and the site, you know, but their budget was their budget. And you know we were able to help them understand that to get this site to uh, the the sort of the kind of experience that they wanted and the rich experience that they wanted um, in the budget that they had, it was important to deprecate some of those more sort of the tougher uh, technical challenges. Um, and you know it 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 they after you know the project was done they realized that that was better for them as well to save those items for a later phase. Um, so, you know, uh, another plan to prove yourself wrong. So this has been out in the wild for, I think it's almost three or four months now. 
Uh, and what we want to do with a client is, you know, because they're looking at aspirational audiences and, and not, you know, existing audiences that they know well, we're going to work with them to kind of, you know, look at analytics, look at, um, you know, get some user, do some user research and get some feedback on some of these features uh, and, you know, really make sure that we got, uh, we got the strategy right for those, those new uh, aspirational audiences. Um, and another is, you know, make, make things easy to change if you are wrong. Um, you know, we did build the site, we build all of our sites in a modular fashion so that if we have to make adjustments, it's not, you know, uh, uh, it's not a major rebuild or, or, or reworking. Um, all right, so that's, that's what I have in terms of presentation. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. On one of the early slides, I, I noticed you had a line that said drag and drop. So I'm curious, on the, and you didn't show any pictures of the back end, how that, the content is actually created. Yeah, yeah. I is, can, is there actual? The, well, the paragraphs, is, it's, so it's not, a, um, it's not drag and drop in the same way that, you know, maybe you're thinking in WordPress, some of those are layout builders and things like that. It's, it's actually using paragraphs and being able to add paragraphs and drag and drop to rearrange them. Not, so, yeah. so, so the, the content editors or creators don't see the page as it's displayed unless they preview it. Yeah. That's Which is the same way our, the yeah. same issues we deal with. Yeah. Without a layout builder. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, you know, we had a lot of debates about using uh, display suite versus layout builder, um, but we've just found display suite is it's it's worked well for us, um, and we haven't had clients um, who who need who needed to be able to build layouts. We sort of designed the layouts for them in flexible ways, and there's you know, but but they're um, they're not the sort of that level of admin, right? And and we're we're giving them some structure uh, around which to uh, you know. Uh, if they have a particular need, we're giving them tools to satisfy that need. Um, but we're, you know, we haven't had the occasion to kind of let them build entire new layouts and kind of give them access to, to that. Well, I was just thinking more in the realm of within the within the guidelines, the layouts you're providing them, the ability to say, okay, I want I want to drag this band or this collection or whatever the paragraph I type is. A, to a different location on a page, or make a page too concrete on that kind of. They, yeah, it's where a, they can design as they're actually looking at it, but they. But yeah, not as they're looking at it. It's yeah. it's it's the Drupal admin theme. Right. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. What service do you guys use for the translation? Uh, right now, they are not using native translation, um, and I actually. They don't even, I don't think they have, they don't have Google Translate on here either. Um, that was a, we, we debated about that as well. Um, and, you know, what our developers didn't want to do was build the site and then try to do native translation later. So we said to the client, you know, if we do this, again, their budget was limited. We said, if we, if we do this in the beginning, um, you know, you have to make the decision that you are committed to translating all, you know, a, a good part of this site, like if that's really your strategy. And they realized they didn't have the capacity to do that. So uh, there would be a trade-off in what we could build. We'd have to use much more of the budget uh, to deliver that. Yes? What does the uh, region thing on the site do? That? Yeah, that's oh, I'm sorry. The, oh, yeah, this is Google Translate. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's Google Translate. Yeah. Sorry. Are you using the core translation models, or...? No, it's not. It's it's just Google. It's a Google Translate. Um, uh, I I don't know how exactly that's built, but I know it's Google Translate. It is not. It is not core. It's not native translation uh, in Drupal. Or, yes. No, that, that's what they wanted us to do that. They wanted to be able to sort of, and we've done that before. We've done integrations with DAMS, uh, digital asset management systems, and sort of letting, uh, we, we work with a number of libraries and pulling in, um, you know, assets that are stored in, in a digital, um, digital platform. Uh, but, you know, we, we said, look, we, 
you have to kind of prioritize what you want us to do here. Do you want this exquisite experience or do you want that kind of integration? And they actually realized um, that it was more advantageous because not all of their collection items are on here. It's, it is a subset of their most you know, interesting pieces and it's not difficult for them to add items as they go, but they had a little more control also over uh, the photography. They actually hired a photographer um, to, to photograph their collections in a very artistic way. So that when you're looking at, um, oops. You know, when you're looking at these, these are, these are not the images that are living uh, in their digital library, right? These are, these are uh, curated images. So it, it turned out to be uh, really beneficial to the project. And you had a question. Uh, that so. was basically my question. So basically there is no connection to any collection management software. So effectively the library people are entering the same metadata twice for those things they want on the site? This is very different content though. This is much more interpretive. Um, and when you go to a collection item, there is, um, right, there are links to the catalog. This is now in French. Uh, but, right, there are, there are links to the, to the mark record. Uh, it, it wasn't, uh, again, we made that decision early on to kind of separate those two experiences. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the camp.